The 2022 American Urological Association annual meeting is well underway in the Big Easy. Once again, thousands of urologic professionals have convened to discuss the latest in urologic care. And this time we've all been so happy to be in person. AUA TV starts right now. Welcome back, everyone. We're so excited to have you here for the 2022 AUA Annual Meeting. My name is Dina Baer, and I'll be your host today. Stay tuned as this year, we'll be covering all the latest in the field of urologic care, continuing our tour of organizations that are leading in the field, and also speaking to experts that are here on site about some of the leading topics at this year's meeting. First, we got the chance to speak to the president of the Urologic Care Foundation and the recipient of the Global Humanitarian Award. Dr. Harris Nagler, who is giving the UCF presidential address, and Dr. Shokti Das, who is the recipient of the Global Humanitarian Award, are joining me now. Gentlemen, it is a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Dr. Nagler, I will begin with you and the focus of your presidential address. So what we'll be talking about is the remarkable evolution of the Urology Care Foundation. We started as a foundation that supported research. We then developed patient education materials. And more recently, we've launched a humanitarian initiative. And you'll be announcing, I know, the Humanitarian Award, which of course you are the recipient. Tell me about how that feels. Uh, it feels a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really, uh, uh, excited and I'm grateful to be acknowledged by Urology Care Foundation and my friends like Dr. Nagler and others. Well, let's we, delve more deeply into that, the work that went into you getting this award. Tell us a little about that. I have been into the so-called philanthropy or service to humanity uh, since my early life, mainly encouraged by my mother. I started my service work at Mother Teresa's. And then I grew up, and uh, then the urology and other surgical endeavors followed that. What an amazing beginning, and how you've carried that torch through the years. Are there things that you can talk about specifically that, that you have done that you're very proud of? Yeah, before I do that, uh, let me uh, thank two people who really promoted and encouraged me and has been supporting me. And first is my mother. It's a tremendous encouragement from her right from the early childhood. And the next is my wife. She's, she's a rock standing beside me even when I'm operating in Gaza emits some sporadic drone bombing, or I'm in, in uh, Afghanistan talking to the Taliban leaders, you know, begging them to allow me to start a school for girls. But she was always there, never, always with her silent prayers. She encouraged me and supported me, so I'm grateful to them. So you've given us a little hint in that answer of some of the great works that you have done. Is there something that you're particularly proud of? I am proud of, uh, aside from my medical mission work, which has taken me to uh, India, Bangladesh, to Kenya, Haiti, and several other countries, in which I continue to do that. I do a monthly mission at Mexico, Sun Blast, Mexico. Aside from that, I'm very much interested and have pursued education for girls. I have a very soft corner for girls' education. And I'm very proud to have started and supported 56 schools in six countries. And, you know, I have, I have helped promote it and supported, continue to support about 4,000 girls 
I run a small orphanage in India where 14 girls are really blossoming in their education and health. So there are quite a few things uh, that I like to remain involved with, you know. Well, Dr. Das is clearly raising the bar here. <laughs> Dr. Nagler, I want you to talk about why this award is so important to the field, and clearly you can see inspiration to other people. So, listening to Dr. Das, and, and I knew many of, the, of his endeavors, but the scope of them and the commitment and the dur durability of that commitment is truly remarkable. He is an inspirational in individual, which is why we are proud to have awarded him with this recognition award. Dr. Das represents what we should do. He shows us what we can do, and he really drives us to a higher level uh, in terms of our expectations of ourselves. So when you think about what young physicians, when they listen to him and what he's done, how will this impact them, do you think? Our hope is that there will be many Dr. Dases in the future. That is the goal of the humanitarian initiative of the Urology Care Foundation. Well, thank you both so much. It was such a pleasure meeting you. <laughs> and congratulations again. Next, we hit the conference floor as we want to hear from you, the members, what your biggest takeaway has been at this year's meeting. My biggest takeaway from the meeting so far is I'm just so happy to be back in person. And um, I've been fortunate enough to train all across the country. So um, I've been, you know, in East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, and now everyone's together. Um, so that's been really wonderful. My biggest takeaway has been uh, all of the great work that's being done in bladder cancer. That's where I've spent most of my time so far. Um, and it's just been fun to see all of the cool things people are doing all over the country. Um, and there was uh, another session on aging and senescent cells and um, how that relates to cancer. And it's just been a really, uh, it's, it's uh, it's been a really interesting set of talks, so. I would say as a resident, just getting the opportunity to, one, meet people from around the country. This is my first time at a national meeting because of COVID, and so just getting to meet different leaders in the field has been really inspiring. And number two, just there's a lot of new technology, I think, that has been developed over the last year, especially with COVID. I think people have more time to do research and all that. And I'd say just getting to meet with people around the country and see what they're doing, kind of, it's very inspiring to us, too, to bring that here, hopefully. I really enjoyed getting to meet new urologists and uh, reunite with people from my past. Um, I'm uh, currently a resident, so um, it's just a really good opportunity to uh, network and meet new people and really see how everyone's um, passionate about urology and you know excited to uh, return to discussing uh, urology topics and the you know upcoming research and all the new innovations. Dr. Kareem Shami is here now talking about a pivotal trial for invasive bladder cancer. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Tell us a little bit about the research. So patients with uh, bladder cancer that is no longer responding to BCG have very limited options. Uh, the standard of care for those patients would mean uh, they'd have to undergo surgical removal of the entire bladder and the surrounding organs. And so this is an unmet need. And so we uh, conducted this phase two, phase three trial to address this unmet need. And what were some of the results? So we enrolled uh, 83 patients in the trial, and these patients have had uh, prior BCG therapy. You know, they've had at least median, a mean number of doses was about 16 installations of BCG, and they failed BCG. And so what we did was we gave them a combination of BCG plus an IL-15 superagonist, which further stimulates the immune system to fight cancer. And what we found was that 71% of patients had resolution of their tumors. And if you follow these patients long enough, two years later, half of those patients that responded are still disease free. Wow, so what's the next step? So next step is obviously submitting the, the, the data to the FDA and hopefully get it approval and um, actually offer it to patients out in the lay community. Wow, so you don't see larger trials. You really believe that this is ready to go in patient practice. Absolutely, and so the FDA clearly sees this as a uh, disease that is that has um, very limited treatment options and the FDA will allow us to submit a study, a single arm study in this disease space. This sounds like a real game changer. 
It is, absolutely. It's a game changer for patients with bladder cancer and very limited options. So when you're here, you must be excited to talk about it because when you think about the population of physicians who could offer this to their patients, when prior to this, they had to say, sorry, we have no options. Yeah, and so you know the, the options we've had were uh, patients who, the last time an FDA drug was approved prior to a couple years ago was 20 years ago, and the efficacy of that data was suboptimal. Two years ago, the FDA did approve another drug, um, systemic, but the data was not nearly as impressive as what we're finding with this combination. Were there any side effects that were really terribly detrimental for patients? Not at all. Only 3% of patients had to discontinue the drug, so it's very, very well tolerated. Sounds great. Thank you. A real step ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and kick off our tour of organizations making a difference in the field of urologic care. First, we head to Ohio, where the Ohio State's Department of Urology's mission is to alleviate patients suffering from urologic disorders through an integrative model of extraordinary clinical care, patient-centered discovery, and educational innovation in service of the citizens of Ohio and beyond. I have the great privilege to lead the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center Department of Urology. And it's really a phenomenal group of individuals. We have 16 faculty focused on adult urology, and we have another six faculty with academic appointments in the department who are focused on pediatric urology and whose practices are at the Nationwide Children's Hospital. The Department of Urology hopes to deliver transformational urologic care. We see our future being very bright. Our faculty and learners are growing in numbers. The expansion of our research and clinical facilities is outstanding, and we're really translating research into the clinic. All of this will allow us to have the greatest impact that we can on the delivery of urologic care in our communities. From robotic and laparoscopic surgeries to everyday kidney stone and sexual dysfunction treatment, Mount Sinai's urology department is prepared for any challenge that comes its way. Let's take a closer look. The mission for the Department of Urology at uh, Mount Sinai Downtown is to be a world-class uh, entity for healthcare, uh, but also delivered in a community setting. Many of us have done procedures or worked in areas that no one else has worked in before. Uh, I personally performed the world's first robotic single port donor nephrectomy. This is an operation where we remove a kidney for donation in another patient through one small incision. Minimally invasive surgery as a whole has really revolutionized the way that we treat urologic cancers. We're now able to perform the operation with less blood loss, less pain, and the majority of our patients are receiving zero narcotics postoperatively. A major advantage of being at Mount Sinai is we have one of the largest residency programs in the country, and we have access to state-of-the-art technology that other programs are still dreaming of. The Cleveland Clinic Glickman Urological and Kidney Institute's activities encompass a unique combination of high volume and challenging clinical cases, extensive basic and translational scientific efforts, and innovative laboratory research conducted in an environment that nurtures the future leaders of its specialties. In surgery, there are several options to do or manage a certain problem. And the more options you have, the better you can custom make the approach to the patient. So it's not like one size fits all. And by customizing your approach, you can serve the patient to the maximum needs and improve the outcomes. And that's what we thrive to serve our patients with at our department. It's the mechanical age and next is gonna be the smart AI application in robotics so that not only that you do a precise surgery, but actually you're guided by the best, fastest, most precise analytics at the get-go while operating, while taking care of your patient.
Pacific Edge is a cancer diagnostics company. They specialize in the discovery of diagnostic and prognostic tests for better detection and management of cancer. Pacific Edge is uh, an oncology diagnostics company founded and headquartered in Dunedin, New Zealand um, with offices in Hershey, Pennsylvania um, that makes uh, diagnostic tests for um, detection of bladder cancer. And when we were able to use this technology of gene expression microarray and look at every single gene, 20,000 genes in a single experiment, it really changed the whole game. And so for me that's been utterly remarkable to have access to phenomenal technology and really dig into the heart of cancer biology. When the urine is collected, it's immediately combined with our proprietary buffer and that stabilizes the messenger RNA um, at ambient temperature for up to 12 days. To commercialize technology that I think is just incredibly interesting from a scientific perspective um, is, is an absolute privilege. Dr. Kyle Richards is here now talking about the use of apps in urology. I think a lot of people don't even know what is available at this point, so give us a little bit of an overview. Apps have really taken off uh, in the healthcare field uh, really the past 20 years. I remember when I started medical school, I received a personal digital assistant, or PDA, and that was my first exposure to apps, and that was in 2007. And then in 2010, these tablets came out, uh, Apple started and then uh, we also have had you know a, just a plethora of, uh, of smartphones that have come out and with that there have been hundreds of thousands if not um, over a million apps that have have followed um, and many it have come into the, the healthcare space and as a healthcare provider uh, some of these apps are useful for us uh, others are you know less useful and it's hard to sort of sift through to figure out which, which of these apps uh, are, are useful in our day in and day out practice. An app for a healthcare provider has to uh, help us to make a diagnosis, it has to help us to find a good treatment, has to help us to pick a medication to treat a patient with, uh, and it, it has to be something that is at the point of care. Um, so it, on your phone, on a tablet, uh, and and we can use these apps to help uh, hopefully improve the outcomes of the patients that we care for. Time is so critical for physicians right now and I think the demand is really increasing. How much are these apps helping with that while still allowing for that very important communication with patients? Yeah, so, so a good app should uh, allow you to be more efficient uh, with your day in and day out work and, and a lot of healthcare providers are being asked to see more patients in shorter amounts of time. Uh, we're asked to go to multiple hospitals oftentimes, uh, different clinics throughout the facility, go from the operating room to clinic and back and forth. So you have to find out ways to make your life easier, to become more efficient in how you take care of your patients. And a good app allows you to do that. So if you have the app on your phone, how are you getting past some of those privacy concerns for patient data? So there's a, a couple of apps that I think uh, many of my colleagues use for clinical care uh, that are HIPAA, HIPAA compliant. So Doximity is a good example of one that's HIPAA compliant and that I think really took off uh, for clinical care at the start of the pandemic when we had shifted towards telehealth and making a lot of telephone calls to patients from home. And the nice thing with the Doximity app is you can call a patient through the app from your own personal cell phone and it looks like the call is coming from the hospital. So that protects the provider uh, and keeps their you know, cell phone out of their uh, patient's hands. Another example is a, a very common uh, electronic health record uh, that's used around the country is Epic. And Epic has a platform called Epic Haiku, which is also HIPAA compliant. So it protects the patient's uh, private health information and it allows providers to access some of the electronic health record from their tablet or smartphone. 
uh, in a confidential way. So I'm hearing you say you can do this from your living room. Is it invading the personal time of the physician or are those things that they would be doing anyway? So it's really reducing the amount of time you're spending working even from home. So I think uh, it, it, as a provider, I think providers have to be careful about that. Uh, so you have to sort of find some separation, some work-life balance, so to speak. And um, so many a time after hours, messages um, will be addressed on the next day. Uh, you get clinical staff oftentimes in the office to help address those uh, messages that come through. So you have to you know, ensure that uh, you're not uh, you know, constantly checking your, your messages after hours. Uh, it's, it's a struggle that a lot of us have to, have to deal with. Right, but overall, I think it's helping both patient and physician. Absolutely, yeah, these, uh, there are apps um, um, to help physicians do their job, and then there are apps on the patient side uh, to help them communicate uh, with their providers, also to help them, uh, for instance, uh, there are a, a, a plethora of apps to help patients uh, collect data at home that can then get transported to their provider, or they can uh, use that app uh, to collect their data at home, whether it be their voiding diaries or uh, other cancer-related uh, types of outcomes. They can bring that data with them on their app and show that to the provider, or there are some electronic health records that can integrate that data directly uh, from the patient's uh, 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 device. Right, and that sure enhances care. Dr. Richards, thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm joined now by Dr. Alp Center, and we're talking about boosting kidney transplantation. And I think before we get into the idea of increasing transplantation, we need to discuss what some of the challenges are. The big, one of the biggest challenges in kidney transplantation is the supply and demand issue. So right now, just in North America, there are over 100,000 patients who are waiting for kidney transplants. And unfortunately, every year, you know, three to five percent of them die while waiting on the transplant wait list, which is quite unfortunate. So the biggest challenge is how do we meet that demand? And this uh, rates of renal failure are going up not only in North America, but also globally. So we're not the only region in the world that's have, having these problems. So the, what the transplant community has done is really increase their awareness. And that's really key when we talk about transplantation, increasing that awareness in the public to know that, you know, uh, as a deceased donor, make sure that loved ones sign their donor cards. And also, as living donors, how can we participate in this, both as altruistic donors as well as potential living donors to people that we know who have kidney failure? And I think it's even more pronounced in certain communities, which makes it very difficult it in terms of donors. Can you discuss that? Sure. Uh, so certain communities, some, um, you know, African-American communities, um, the, the discrepancy is much greater. Uh, depending on type where you are in the country, in, in the United States, the discrepancy is much larger. I'm from Canada. Um, we have, our numbers are equal. I mean, we don't have as many people on the wait list, but at the same time, the discrepancy is still there. And so we have, we have an indigenous population that has a um, wider gap in terms of supply and demand issue as well in terms of organs. So that's very important as we move forward in terms of how to reach communities and how do we, maybe the messaging has to be a little bit different and we have to do better outreach, I think, to ensure that all patients are taken care of equally. And I think that outreach really can include the education of if you want to donate to a loved one, it doesn't necessarily have to be that you are a match. Absolutely. You could then have it trickle down to other families. Absolutely. And I think that's the beauty of this. In the, historically, we always used to try to match it so that, you know, if I want to donate to you, you and I went together to a transplant program and we tried. And if we couldn't, it, it was the case. But now, you know, if I want to donate to you, we're not a match. It's very easy for us to still go to a transplant program together and say, listen, I'm interested in donating. You you need a kidney transplant, how do we make this work? Whether it's a uh, local paired exchange, it's a national paired exchange or international paired exchange, all those things are possible. And I think that's the exciting thing that's coming up in transplantation because that was not um, as widely popular as it was a few years ago. So I think that's really gaining some traction. And I think we're really a global community when it comes to renal failure. So I think you know, we, don't, we, we shouldn't be thinking in our microcosm of, you know, how we are in North America or in our state or in our province. We should be looking globally um, and potentially doing those exchanges across countries. Right. And what are other ways you think that we can really try to boost transplantation? So, you know, we, we as transplanters, you know, in the, as researchers, as physicians and surgeons, there's a lot of research going into how to Im improve that 
how to um, narrow that gap between the donor, available donors and recipients. You know, other ways to do it would be using um, graphs that are more marginal. So kidneys historically, um, if they weren't, seem to be coming from don deceased donors that were as healthy as a center would like, um, sometimes they would discard them, they would not use them. But now there's new technologies that are coming around that allow us to test organs. So for example, you know, if they come to our lab, the, the organs there, we put it on a machine and see how it behaves on the machine. If it behaves appropriately and if it's, you know, if it has the right parameters, it has a good flow, that kidney could then be used for transplantation where otherwise it may have been discarded. So I think that's a huge uh, number because if you think just in the United States, about four to 5,000 kidneys can be discarded annually. Some of those should be discarded, but some of them maybe can be salvaged. So when we think of you know, 100,000 people waiting on the wait list, if you could save another 500 kidneys or 1,000 kidneys, that's still 1,000 people that can return back to normal life. Um, and that's, that's very powerful. And that's the key, isn't it? We're not just talking about numbers, we're talking about people. And this is really about saving lives. 100%, absolutely. So if you get a kidney transplant, your lifespan increased by five years instantly. That's incredible. Uh, we know that dialysis, although is a good stopgap, it's kind of like a Band-Aid. I mean, we're just putting Band-Aids and holes in our boat. And so the way to fix it is get a new boat. And so we need to get a kidney transplant. And that's really the optimal mode of renal replacement therapy. So ideally, all patients who are in kidney failure should get a kidney transplant. But as we talked about, there's a big supply and demand problem. It's such important information, yeah. Dr. Sunner. Thank you for devoting your time to getting the word out because it could save lives. 100%, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. The mission of the AUA Urology Scientific Mentoring and Research Training Academy, or USMART, is to foster creative and impactful mentorship between developing urology physician scientists and established investigators with an exemplary track record of leadership and mentorship. Let's learn a little bit more. USMART is a program that was put together by the AUA to identify mentors around the country to be paired up with a mentee or a urologist that is looking to start a research career. It's a great opportunity for us to work with an individual who has common interests that we do, and we advise them about how to start a career as a surgeon scientist, physician scientist, in whatever field they are interested in doing. It's been really helpful for me. I had some questions about you know, what I should do next in terms of different types of projects that I wanted to pursue, and then how I was going to make all of that work with the clinical aspirations that I had. And so it was really helpful to talk through those things with her. And then also, you know, at the end of the day, once you develop that relationship with um, this person, this is your mentor. And so she's been really very instrumental in writing letters for me for some of my grant applications and just in um, helping to introduce me to other people who might be helpful as I move along in my career. We all get involved in uh, mentoring because we care about what we do. We care about the field of urology. We care about advancing and discovery. Uh, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is actually not by us. In a lot of ways, our careers are over. We want to be able to um, advise and be able to mentor and teach others how to be successful. And it's really hard today to, be, uh, to have a clinical practice as well as a research program. So if we are to, we, we're essentially giving back. Um, the AUA and the CARE Foundation did so much for us, specifically me, it's, it, it may only makes sense for me to give back. Uh, and that's what this is about. And honestly, it, it's not about the time. It's really about promoting young people and uh, getting them involved. Today we got the chance to connect with multiple startup organizations looking to enter the urology space and they're showcasing their products or services in front of thousands of urology professionals. Let's see what they have to show. The mission of Virtuoso Surgical is really to revolutionize rigid endoscopy. We're going to give surgeons two tools where they've only ever had one and both of those tools are going to be dexterous, they're robotically driven and they allow surgeons to do things like retract and resect with accuracy, precision, and dexterity that they've never had before. Kudos to the AUA for doing the Emerging Corner for startups like us that are in the process of working their way through getting uh, early thoughts of acceptance by the field, as well as working towards regulatory approval 
this is amazing. And so thanks a lot to the AUA. The main mission of Marion Surgical is basically the whole adage, measure twice, cut once. The idea is that you practice and get perfect on your patient before you actually go into the OR. And you, we do that through virtual reality. We take a patient's CT scan, turn it into a 3D model that you can practice on, and then you can go in and do the real case. AUA is kind of the Super Bowl of urology. Uh, we have Dr. Tim Everich right here who's doing the surgery with our simulator. And you know, you wouldn't get a chance to, to meet people like this unless you were at a big event. So we figure this is the, the biggest uh, event that, that we can actually exhibit at and get that kind of traction with medical device companies that we could partner with or with surgeons that might want to put this into their practice or, or training hospitals that might want to incorporate this into their training programs. Let's now finish our tour of organizations all around the world that are leading in urologic care. First, we head to the Tallwood Urology and Kidney Institute, which is dedicated to improving the health and healing of the communities they serve. As a member of Hartford Healthcare, which is a diverse, integrated healthcare system, they provide cutting edge, personalized and coordinated care. Let's take a look. Tallwood Urology and Kidney Institute is a leader in the field because I think we're data driven. We've maintained databases for every single robotic surgery we've done, and we've done over 8,000. The advantages of robotic surgery are that you can do complex reconstructive surgery in a tight space. Here at Hartford Healthcare, in a joint venture with Yale, we will be opening a proton center. The advantage there is we can use high doses and protect normal tissues as much as possible. Providers meet on a monthly basis which allows for a more collaborative, coordinated approach to patient care, where we bring together multiple specialties, has allowed for improved patient outcomes, especially when we want to adopt new technology and new treatment pathways. And hopefully saving more lives. The Desai Sethi Urology Institute is my vision of creating a freestanding urology institute involving multiple disciplines to solve urologic problems and healthcare problems. What we have done with COVID and male reproduction research is that we have identified the presence of the virus in the testis and the penis long after the initial infection. But more importantly, we found the safety of COVID vaccines on male fertility we're able to perform not only novel research, but also clinical care that goes above and beyond what you'll find at most other cancer centers. We also strive to become a regional, national, and a global resource for urology communities across the entire world, and a great resource for collaboration to solve common problems. King's Health Partners at King's College London have a long history of surgical simulation. Inspired by training in aviation, the aim is to improve safety by training away from patients. Let's take a closer look. Surgical simulation has been around for a number of years. At King's Health Partners, we are regarded as pioneers in this field. We developed Simulate as the first international randomized control trial to address whether surgical simulation really made better and also safer surgeons. It shows, for example, it reduces patient complications by 50%. We surgeons have always focused on doing things with our hands. Can we improve the minds of the surgeon? And direct evidence showing that mental training did improve the connectivity between key areas of the brain for motor performance. How can we use digital surgery uh, to improve outcome for our patients. We are in a position to generate annotations of prostate gland robustly and very efficiently. We are very excited to be part of this fantastic digital future, which I think will be good for patient care and good for surgical training. Well, that's it for us here at AUA. We hope you all have enjoyed being back in person. Stay safe, and we'll see you next year in Chicago.